Hi folks, thanks for joining us. Welcome everyone. Hello. Hello. Hello, good evening. Hello. Hello. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining. Great to see you all here. We'll just give it another few seconds to let people come on in. And then we can make a start. Okay, folks. Well, good evening and a very warm welcome to the online Nature Trek Roadshow. And a very good morning or good afternoon to you, should you be joining us from another time zone. It's lovely to have you all here. I'm Sarah Frost, Nature Trek's marketing manager, and I'll be your host for this evening. If you're on our mailing list, you'll have recently received our awesome newsletter featuring new tours in the UK and overseas. And we've had a flurry of bookings in the office over the last two weeks in response to this. If you'd like a copy, we'd be very happy to pop one in the post to you. Just drop us an email and we'll do that for you. Now, tonight we're continuing our exploration of Europe, this time heading east, visiting Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary and Poland. Now, we pride ourselves at Nature Trek for being a tour operator that has many staff who also develop as naturalists and leaders. And our staff are passionate naturalists, which of course is vital in the creation of our wildlife holidays. Mm -hmm. And so joining me from our operations team are Alison Steele, who oversees several of our Hi, tours in Eastern Europe, and also David Phillips, who'll be talking to us about Hungary. And it's a real pleasure to welcome three of our external leaders who are joining us tonight, Andrew Cleave and Richard Bashford, who are speaking to us from their homes in England, and also Jason Mitchell, who's joining us from France. So just a reminder, you can pop your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, be this questions about requirements for travel overseas or more information about a particular species which has been mentioned, we're very happy to answer all of these. We'll try and type responses to you throughout the evening, but we'll also take questions at the end where we have some time for discussion. So I hope you're sitting comfortably folks, pop your feet up and for the next two hours, you can just relax in the company of our expert naturalists as they take you on a virtual journey around Europe. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Jason, who's going to start our evening by taking us to Romania. Over to you, Jason. Thank you, Sarah. Right, so I've just got to share my screen with everybody. Okay. There we go. Hopefully you can see that. So yes, welcome. My name is Jason Mitchell. I've been working for Nature Trek since 2007. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, I'm based in France. I do many of my tours in La Brenne, which is where I live, and more widely in France. But this evening, I'm talking to you about Romania's Danube Delta and the Carpathian Mountains. This is a typical scene with the traditional haystacks. Um, find myself often stopping the minibus for people to take shots like this. It is quite fantastic. So just to uh, set the scene, there's Romania, sandwiched between Bulgaria and the U Ukraine. This tour is a 10 day tour. I should start by saying actually, it's, it's incredibly, incredibly popular this tour. Um, I've led it for several years each September, but it runs through the spring and summer and there's between seven and eight weeks run um, in the Carpathians and Danube each year. It's that popular. Now, it's a 10 day tour. We fly into Bucharest and once we're in Bucharest, we head around about three hours northwest to a little village called Vulcan which is situated in the, um, the famous um, the Carpathian Mountains and the home of Dracula, the <laughs> reputed home of Dracula, Transylvania. We spend uh, three nights and two full days in this area, um, exploring the mountains. We go in search of eagles and bears, very exciting things like that. And after which we will move we spent about a day actually, because it's a fair distance, uh, about a six hour drive, more or less due east out here um, to a city called Tulcha, which is positioned on the southern shore of the Danube. And we can actually see the Ukraine just across the water. We spend four nights, 
three or four days exploring the Danube Delta, after which we come back to Tolcha and we are housed in a rather comfortable guest house there and we will explore the, uh, the steppe and the Black Sea coast for the next couple of days before eventually returning to Bucharest. So having spent a comfortable night with Gigi and Elena in the guest house in, in Vulcan, hopefully we've woken up without a headache, um, having sampled um, the local aperitif, Dracula's Tears as Gigi likes to call it. We will head to the Piet Pietra Criuli National Park and the Kingstone Mountains. Again, a typical, typical scene here. We have some horses in the foreground. We often see goats and sheep and cattle grazing the lower slopes in this area. Black woodpecker, this is a real stonker. This is high on people's wish list. It certainly is mine. This is a handsome male with a full red cap. We don't always see them. They're remarkably secretive for such a large bird, about the size of a crow. Um, but they're very, very vocal, so we more than often hear them. Another vo very vocal species is the spotted nutcracker. Now, this bird is usually seen um, in small, small numbers, but in exceptional years when there's um, a shortage of food supply, it erupts. We have these invasion years, and sometimes uh, there are hundreds flying around the canopy. It's quite remarkable, often looking for hazelnuts, but also various cones from the spruces in that area. In the wilderness through the forest, uh, we often come across this handsome fellow. This is the yellow-bellied toad, and uh, again, quite a showstopper. Um, there are several other amphibians in the area, reptiles also. We see marsh frogs, tree frogs, things like the Balkan wall lizard, and occasionally snakes. Certainly gr grass snakes are fairly common. Back to the lower slopes as we're returning towards the minibus for lunch, we will see invariably large numbers of red backed shrikes. This is a rather handsome male in its breeding plumage. Normally by this time of year, they're looking a little bit more drab and there's lots of immature birds about as well, but they are incredibly confiding and they'll perch up uh, in the hawthorns and the bramble bushes and the photographers absolutely just delight in this species. Always have uh, one eye to the sky. We're looking out for, spot it, uh, for the booted eagle in this, this instance, this is a, a pale phase bird. But um, if the passage is really, really happening, we can have step buzzers, buzzers absolutely flooding the sky. That's one of the commoner species. They're often joined by the occasional short-toed eagle, um, occasionally ospreys, black, red kites. The area can be really good for goshawks as well. And in certain, certain years, we will see Levant sparrow hawks as well. Really a tourist attraction effectively in that area and a, a site which has hosted uh, a number of feature length movies is the Zarnesht Gorge. So this is higher up into the gorge. When we first arrive, we're moving through a wooded area and we're on the lookout for the willow tip. Um, like so many woodland birds, more often heard than seen, but we usually do get fl fleeting glimpses of this uh, cracking little bird. And this is one of the few places in Europe where I've actually seen them uh, literally in the same bush or tree side by side with their lookalike, the marsh tip. And um, this is a wonderful opportunity to uh, talk about the distinguishing features between these species. Sadly, this is a bird which is in, in uh, quite serious decline in the UK. But with Romania being largely unexploited, um, still very traditional methods of woodland management and farming, uh, there are species um, that we once knew in numbers, which is still really relatively common. Have many insects there as well. Now, the last time I was there, sadly, way back in 2019, we had a remarkable year for the Camberwell beauty. Some of you might know this is the morning cloak if you're joining us from the States. But that particular area is really good as well for things like water ringlet, um, scotch argus, uh, fiery copper, um, some really handsome species of butterfly too. However, this is invariably the show stopper. Uh, this is the um, this is the the war creeper, and uh, 
basically these are quite hard to see in the summer because they are nesting um, high up in the mountains um, but we occasionally get to see these in the autumn when they descend to lower levels and this particular bird uh, which was back in 2018 I believe was incredibly confiding and this next slide will demonstrate that fact. Here we go this is the local guide Laurentio and you can just about see there uh, circled in red. That is the actual wall creeper that was photographed. Uh, we weren't chasing it around at all, it was just sat there. Um, the gorge is very steep as you might imagine and um, it doesn't get a lot of sunlight through the day so this particular bird just seemed to be enjoying catching a few rays. Uh, no visit to Transylvania is complete without a visit to Bram Castle, the reputed abode of Dracula, or at least Bram Stoker's Dracula, was based on this castle. And although it's a little bit touristy down below, the castle itself is very, yeah, it, it's, it's very tastefully done. And um, I really enjoy a visit there. It's uh, quite stunning. Uh, some of the furniture inside is, is absolutely remarkable. There is also the, the, the dungeons and the little bit for the kids where you can see the various uh, instruments of torture, but we won't too, talk too much about that. Um, I mentioned bears briefly. Well, on our way to the bear hide, we stop off in a, uh, a regular site for nesting lesser spotted eagles. Some years we miss them because it is a migratory species in this area and they may have moved on. Probably nine times out of ten, we catch up with this impressive species of eagle. We then head further up the valley towards a private bear hide, and this is what we're after. Now, this isn't one of my photographs, but this is. However, this gives you a taste of what we might see from the hide. Um, basically, the, uh, there are guides, there are guards, should I say, that protect this area, and occasionally they put out food, natural things, nuts, berries, that type of thing, to attract the, the bears in. In this photograph, you can see there's a couple of adults there with two cubs in the background, and it is not unusual to have bears into double figures. Exceptionally, uh, they can even be joined with wolves. I've never had that pleasure, but I know a number of guides have seen wolf coming into these feeding areas. Although, not in full daylight like this, because it, it's invariably it's dark at that point, but quite often we will see a Euro owl a paler, large version of the tawny owl, very black eyed, fierce looking beast. And occasionally we've also had night jars fly by. So, sadly, we went to the Carpathians, and I mentioned that it's a fairly long uh, transfer a day, but we break it up. We stop off at the lovely Neo Renaissance castle um, of Peles. Um, we stop off also. Uh, in the plains as we start to come down from the Carpathian Mountains, we pass through agricultural areas which are crisscrossed with um, various uh, wet ditches and black stalks are relatively common. We can see huge numbers of these birds. On telegraph poles, we see the, the absolutely striking uh, European roller. And again, we will see these as well, hopefully uh, from the floating hotel on the Danube Delta. I've already mentioned that um, September is a good time for passage migrants and the red-footed falcon is high on everybody's list. This is a stunning male, uh, so-called the red-footed falcon for the male. So we reach Torture and we will be joining um, the Floating Hotel, which is our accommodation for the next four nights and three days. First of all, we tend to stay docked in Torture. Um, but then we will join the smaller vessel you can see at the front there. That looks a, wee, a little bit like a tug, but uh, very comfortable tea and coffee facilities, you'll be pleased to hear. And we head out into one of the smaller channels in the old Danube Channel. I say the old Danube Channel because um, decades ago, there was a new channel which just cuts through all of the lovely meandering old river and the oxbows and the lakes and heads straight down to the Red Sea. We do use that channel occasionally with the larger floating hotel, but most of our time is spent on these smaller channels. Very quickly, we will find ourselves seeing various herons. The black crown night heron is relatively common, but even more so is the squacko heron. And um, these seem to um, 
spend much of their time hunting the incredibly numerous and very noisy marsh frogs, which uh, frequent the area. Before, uh, not too long, there's invariably shrieks, people would have seen a white-tailed eagle. Now this really is uh, one of the showstoppers, showstoppers of our visit to the Danube Delta. And I still to this day can get over quite how common they are. Now this is a full-blown adult bird um, sporting its white tail. It takes several years to get to this stage, but um, there are lots of females and younger birds kicking around, which are rather browner, but nonetheless impressive. And we occasionally see them perched up, picking apart a big catfish or pike. Of course, you think of, the, you think of large flocks of flamingo, um, flamingos, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Uh, pelicans even. This is the uh, white pelican. This is a migratory bird. So again, we see them in varying numbers, but invariably in their thousands. Um, sometimes we uh, make our way later in the week along the Black Sea coast, we will see these passing through our migra migration in absolutely enormous flocks. Less migratory, tends to move around a little bit. We have the Dalmatian pelican. Uh, we, we don't usually see these in large numbers. It's usually twos and threes, sometimes into double figures, but they do seem to be getting slightly more common. Uh, slightly larger bird, one of the largest wingspans of any European bird, and uh, quite impressive. I mean, it, it's, it's up there with the, the white-tailed eagle in terms of its wingspan. We spend most of our time on the boat, but we do hopefully touch land occasionally. And a favorite spot is Letia, which is the oldest village on the, um, on the Danube. And it's actually situated on an island, which is kind of stabilized with sand dunes, etc. But it's incredibly well kept. And most of them painted this rather attractive blue color. Waders are numerous. We things, see things like little stints, sometimes ten stints, spotted red shanks. But this is the one that I'm always looking out for, the rather delicate, slightly green chan like marsh sandpiper. The channels vary. Some are more wooded, as you saw in an earlier slide. But there is a lot of, there's a lot of reed as well. And when we're in the reed beds, we're looking for this beauty, the bearded tit. Also, the penduline tit is quite numerous as well. Occasionally, because we're outside of the breeding season, we will occasionally use recordings to attract some of the, the top species like the penduline tip, which otherwise are extremely difficult to see. A slightly different habitat. We have a bike plant in the foreground is water soldiers, lots of water lilies. This is a place where we're likely to bump into waterfowl. This is the Frugina stuck. Again, sometimes small numbers, but normally we see them in their thousands. Terns are common, we have lots of marsh terns, black terns, white winged black terns, whisker terns, but the absolute brute amongst the terns is this, the Caspian tern. And uh, this is the size of a herring goat, so not easy to miss. This on the other hand is a little dwarf, or should I say a pygmy. This is the, the pygmy cormorant, and it really is a tiny bird. And we often see them alongside the gray cormorant, the cormorant that you'll know back in the UK and um, it really is very, very small. These often hang around the, the pelicans, they're quite canny, and they will um, take any scraps that the pelicans miss. Things like rails um, and crakes, this is a little crake, are quite common in those areas too. Now this is another one high on the list, this is the bee eater, and we can bump into this bird pretty much anywhere throughout the tour, except possibly the Carpathians, but even then I have seen them migrating in large flocks, high above, we hear the lovely liquid rippling call. Again, a wetland area, lots of, lots of birds of prey on, the, on, uh, on migration. So invariably each, yeah, every time I've been there, we will see at least one osprey, sometimes several. So uh, insects, I'm very keen on dragonflies as well. I lead tours for butterflies and dragonflies. This is a Eastern willow spread wing. Uh, I show this picture as much as anything, to see the chap in the background there. Um, I don't know what he's got there, uh, G and T probably. So the, uh, the accommodation is small, very compact as you'd imagine on a boat, but it, it is very comfortable. And there's a bar and there's hot tea and coffee on tap and some slightly harder beverages too. At this point, we leave 
Hunting Hotel with Back to Tulcha, where we first arrived uh, in the Lowlands and we stop in a rather um, comfortable guest house just 10 minutes from the uh, from where we've left the floating hotel and we explore the, the steppe country and the Black Sea coast. This particular image is up in the Matching Hills and this is in the Oriental Hornbeam Forests. This chap in this car, this is a wonderful scene but this is not uncommon um, as we drive around the road and you often see horses pulling carts along. I remember one uh, notable occasion when we actually saw somebody being pulled along in an open coffin um, and yeah it's happened since as well but anyway it's no, not normally quite like that it's normally a little bit more pleasant and rural. Up in that same habitat we get this little thing it's a type of ground squirrel called a suslik. Some years if it's already a little bit cold they may have gone into hibernation but more often than not we do see this rather attractive um, small ground squirrel. Sometimes if we're extremely lucky, it's joined by, I say joined by the uh, step polecat. More the point, the step polecat is actually uh, hunting the suslik. So um, you know if there's one about because all hell breaks loose and um, there's lots of calling and the suslik suddenly disappear into their burrows and they're gone. Butterflies are numerous too, things like small coppers, but also the lesser fiery copper. Uh, we see things like cardinals. Some years we have lots of swallowtail butterflies, great, band, great bandy graylings. Typically, we're up into about 30 species. Now, when you consider I'm there in September, that's not a bad list. But of course, if you're there on one of the earlier tours, you could be up into 70, 80 species quite easily. Uh, another popular insect is the praying mantis. And um, these, again, um, are relatively common. Lots of bush crickets, grasshoppers too. And, and again, here we go. So this is, this is a big favourite of mine. This is the Spurthi tortoise. And uh, there's a close-up view. These are fairly common. Uh, they were once taken for the pet trade, but that's banned now. So they seem to be building in numbers again. And amphibians. We saw the yellow-bellied toad earlier, and this is a common tree frog. And we, we hear these more often than see them. They get a very rasping call. So hopefully that's given you a bit of a flavor of the Danube and the Carpathian mm. Mountains. And um, um, I will hand you over to Andrew. Hi, thank you, Jason. Just going to start my screen, hopefully. Well, hopefully everybody can see that and hear me. Um, there are some similarities, I must say. The Carpathian Mountains uh, share quite a number of species with where we are in Bulgaria. This trip is called the Flowers of the Balkans. It uh, goes in midsummer, usually around the middle of June. But of course, there's so much else to see. We're up in the Pyrrhon Mountains here. And Bulgaria is just noted for its vast array of flowers, lots of endemic plants, some which you'll be familiar with, you'll know the, the genus maybe, if not the actual species. So we get a really good range of flowers and associated insects. So just a quick look at the map to give you an idea. Well, you can see Romania that um, Jason's been talking about above, uh, just north of Bulgaria. And then we have Turkey down below, Greece, uh, Macedonia, Kosovo, Serbia, and the Black Sea on the other side. It's a bit of a sort of crossing over place. We start in Sofia, we fly to Sofia, about a three hour flight from London. And then we have three centers here. So the first place that we stay is just south of Sofia. And then we head down during the course of the week and end up here almost in Greece, but not quite, but you can see the mountains in Greece when we end up down here at Dospat. So we concentrate mainly on these mountainous areas. And there will be, as you'll see, some similarities with the, the um, plants and animals seen in the Carpathian Mountains. Now, you know you've got to Bulgaria when, of course, you can't read the road signs. And I have got my picture showing the right way around. And of course, the Cyrillic script. I advise you not to make the mistake I did. The first time I went there, I said, oh, this looks like Russian. No, great indignation. No, Russian looks like Bulgarian. The Cyrillic script apparently um, arose in Bulgaria long ago. We actually start off in a short distance from Sofia, 
And it's quite interesting that we travel through the, the recent history of this country. The first place we stay is a lodge that was used by the, the former communist rulers, a sort of hunting lodge. And it's set in this lovely countryside where there are flowers everywhere, just one of the many species of foxglove here and countless numbers of butterflies, extraordinary numbers, things like the black veined white, the things that were once were present in Britain, but now is an extreme rarity. Very occasionally one turns up here, where you won't believe the numbers of black veined whites that you'd see there. So this is our first stop, the Studena Lodge, this hunting lodge set in a big forest. And of course, we're free to wander around. There's, um, the known that the former rulers of course go there now hunting but it's pretty obvious when we go in what it was used for but it's a long way from any roads it's really quiet and we just have bird song and insects buzzing around and of course flowers everywhere once when we arrived there was this most beautiful fragrance in the great dining room of this lodge and they very kindly picked a huge bunch of fragrant orchids for us and some of the other endemic plants of bulgaria to welcome this party of botanists we seem always to get this great place to ourselves. Um, it is very good for just for wandering about, but we do some forays out into the surrounding countryside. But even if we didn't do that, just wandering around in the grounds would be really rewarding uh, for the flowers, the, the butterflies and birds like red back shrike. We've been hearing about tree sparrow, turtle dove, corn bunting, and all sorts of things that once were present here, but are still very common there in Eastern Europe. And insect life generally is very rich because the, the farming practices still haven't quite caught up with the rest of Europe. Um, still traditional farming over much of the country. Well, one of our sites, it's quite accessible to that um, hunting lodge, is this the Bear Mountain, Golobardo Mountain. We're not far from Sofia. Uh, we're still in the, the west of the country, but this is a limestone mountain and it is, you can see largely bare of trees. It's grazed, um, nearby there's some quarrying, but we're free to wander about wherever we want to. And we soon start coming across plants which are vaguely familiar, but obviously different. So this Anthilis vulnerera, this is basically, it is kidney vetch, but it's this beautiful golden subspecies. And so it's in a Balkan endemic. And also this relative of knapweed, a hardhead, centuria, or Emanuelis lowii. Lots of these are named after former rulers uh, or aristocrats in Bulgaria, the striking claret color. So we will spend quite a bit of time out in this open countryside, mainly looking down, I must say, looking down at our feet, looking for interesting plants, but you can't ignore the butterflies and the birds that are round and about. Um, Rosa pendulina, as a, forms a very dense thicket in places, usually by midsummer, it's all flowering very nicely. I have to sometimes, not exactly drag people away, but just point out things that aren't quite as showy, things that you might not see elsewhere. So this one, Joyce is in the name of a bastard toad flax. We have one in Britain, but not this species. So there are a couple of Balkan endemics that we come across. And larkspur, this, uh, I suppose in the past, this would have been called um, a cornfield weed, but it's incredibly scarce now. We occasionally find this in Britain in places, <clears throat> but here, relatively common. Uh, Onosma, this is one of the plants called a, a golden drops. You find a number of these across the Mediterranean and uh, Europe, and this is an endemic species related to things like bugloses. So continuing up the slopes of this, this bare mountain, you can see it's a bit stony underfoot, but none of the places we go are too difficult to walk on. They're all really um, quite straightforward. And with all those flowers, of course, there are butterflies. And at a glance, you think, oh, small heath. And then, of course, look closer and you realise that it's something a little bit different. So the pearly heath would be the common one there. And this hair streak, blue spot hair streak, very typical of that sort of habitat. Now at that time of year, midsummer, it's often very warm and sometimes by late in the afternoon there's a thunderstorm, a sudden downpour, and then it all clears again. So butterfly watching is very good in early in the morning and then a little bit later in the day. And painted ladies, scores and scores of painted ladies, sometimes right in the town centres, but here I see some of these on migration out in the countryside. 
Roman snails as well, after a thunderstorm and the ground is steaming and wet, Roman snails appear um, out on the roads and the paths. A lot of these areas are protected as national parks and although we can see a quarry in the background, many of these have great number of endemic and protected plants and they're all very carefully monitored and looked after. Um, this is a, a Balkan form of the lizard orchid, well at least a species of the lizard orchid, they're one of many orchids that we'd expect to see in a week's exploration. And this is another extreme British rarity. We use the services of a, of a Bulgarian botanist, Vladimir, Vladimir Vladimirov. And my job really is to translate the scientific names into English names and perhaps point out to people the extreme rarity in Britain of some of these plants. So things like that beautiful red hellebrine, which are roadside plants in Bulgaria, incredibly rare in Britain. Actually, we have one site in Hampshire for that, a couple of other sites in Britain. It's really good to catch up with rarities just as casual plants there. And um, the lizard orchids are particularly attractive, not the same species that we have in Britain, slightly more straggly looking plant, but in the same sort of habitats. There's a lot of lovely rolling countryside with traditional farming, not small fields with hedgerows, not quite like Britain, but the large fields but certainly plenty of hedgerows and cover, so ideal for botanists to uh, forage around in, but also good for the bird watching and for the butterflies. Another species of foxglove, this is probably the most common one, Digitalis lanata, has slightly woolly leaves, and as you're driving along in the bus you often see these little uh, clear coloured spikes on wrong roadsides, but there's another one much bigger, not quite as common, which is yellow, Digitalis ambigua, which is the more or less the same size as our foxglove, flowers a little bit later, but with these beautiful yellow flowers. Of course, we spend quite a bit of time in little villages, often stopping for coffee breaks or perhaps near where we're staying. And it's quite good for busybodying, looking in people's gardens. Very often we, we get invited in or someone will come out with a big bowl of cherries or mulberries to offer us. And people here seem really keen on their gardening. And they're often growing things which are turned into jams and pickles and preserves to last them through the winter. In the summer, the time of year we go, of course it's warm and the climate is fine, but there can be very harsh winters there, a real continental climate. So a lovely garden here, well tended, and if you're looking down at the plants you will hear often over your head the sort of bill clapping display of the white stalks, and the villagers seem to take great pride uh, in looking after the stalks, and if the stalks don't nest of their own accord, they'll put up a, an old cartwheel or make some sort of platform for them. So the stalks will be the companions to the gardeners. Not so popular, great source of amusement to the Bulgarians, also the Colorado beetles, and they can't understand why British visitors go mad to see and photograph these things. You don't have to look too hard, unfortunately, to find Colorado beetles anywhere where there are lots of potatoes, should find plenty of them. And of course, butterflies everywhere, a marigold, a pot marigold here, you'll find species that you're familiar with, like brown argus and blues, then you have to look really carefully to properly identify some of them. And any village will have a market stall or lots of market stalls selling all this lovely garden produce and the jams and preserves that they make. So our picnics, lunchtime picnics, often feature uh, really delicious fresh fruits and vegetables and those pickles. Now in the middle of the trip we go to this <clears throat> very important site high up in the mountains and the very famous Rila monastery, an orthodox uh, monastery and it's still inhabited, there are monks there but it's also used as a hotel and a retreat and it's a good place to look at mountain flowers, really quite accessible, and mountain birds as well for that matter and it has the most amazing murals, it's really quite something to see and we're nearly always up in the clouds when we go up there, a bit different from, from down on the plains, the dry, dusty plains. So we're looking at a different forest habitat and all sorts of things that inhabit uh, this monastery. And I just wonder how many black red starts this cat has caught. Uh, that's the sort of place to see them, black red starts, grey wagtails up there. Um, well, um, swallows, swifts. Pallid swift as well, and of course beautiful flower displays. And crag martins also up in that zone. And of course being a monastery, I can't really 
not look at the holy bramble, Rubus sancta, which grows there, not cultivated, just really in the untended areas around the edge of the monastery. But many of the towns are worth looking at as well. Bansko is where we stay in the middle of the trip. And here the old center of the town has been preserved really well, beautifully preserved. And around it is a modern ski resort. And really this developed after the formula, formula um, communist rulers had disappeared. And so around the center of the old town, a modern hotel, so a ski lifts and shops of every description, uh, it's highly organized. In quite a wide awake place in the winter, of course, when the skiing is in operation, but in the summer, really popular tourist destination. And the town is full of beautiful, fragrant lime trees, vast numbers of uh, swifts nest in the church towers and storks nest on the church tower as well. So all the time you have this fragrance of the lime blossom, screaming calls of swifts. And Spanish sparrows often make use of the, um, the stork nests. Many of them are multi-story nests. In fact, here we've got stork cam. There's a camera uh, recording what's going on in the nest and that's being relayed to a building down below, one of the cafes down below. So the modern towns are always well worth a look. And I mentioned the lime trees in the middle of the summer, the smell the scent is fantastic and uncountable numbers of painted ladies um, feeding on the nectar before perhaps migrating over the mountains and carrying on north. There are some wonderful rich hay meadows that, that seem to go on forever. Traditional farming here means that uh, maybe a whole village would look after this area and the meadows would be cut for hay a little bit later on in the season. And we tiptoe very carefully through the meadows because obviously it, it will end up as a crop. A wonderful mixture of meadow plants, things like the cow wheat, field cow wheat, uh, which is a semi-parasitic plant. And in fact, the yellow flowers there our hay rattle, also a semi-parasite. And where you get these rich meadows, of course, a rich insect life. Also, we sometimes flush out as we're walking through things like elephant hawk moths. But also in many of the hotels, there are street, there are outside lights left on all the time. And first job in the morning is often to go and look at the walls or look around the lights to see what moths are still resting there. The Pirin National Park now is a bit further south from Sofia and we spend three days in this area and a couple of days traveling as high up as we can and because of the ski uh, facilities there there are reasonable roads and there are ski lifts at the mountain trails all very well organized nothing too intrusive as you can see but uh, it is easy to get up quite high into the mountains and in the summer uh, most of the people there are intent on hiking reaching some of the highest peaks in Bulgaria uh, or if they're botanists, of course, looking for things like this, this Frivald's fragrant orchid, a very rare plant that grows in boggy places high up in the mountains, just a very few locations for this one. The more striking, which most people will notice, is this, this geum, coccinea, and this bright orangey red color, which again grows in wet places. That is often a marker for the little fragrant orchid, which is a much scarcer plant. Pinus heldrichii uh, is the, the Bosnian pine. It is a very long-lived, very large tree when it's um, able to grow in reasonable conditions. And what the oldest tree in Bulgaria, one of these thought to be about 1,100 years old. But below the trees, um, because there's a reasonably light shade, another really rich flora. Um, one flowered wintergreen is one which we do get as a great rarity in Britain, but here quite common. And over our heads would be the cause of nutcrackers, which you've heard about, and birds like the sombre tit, maybe, and a willow tit as well, uh, would also occur there. And interesting fungi, this little bird's nest fungus, tiny little thing. Um, it would sit on a, a five pence coin, or some very sharp eyed member of our group spotted that once when we were looking for orchids. So lots of this sort of thing, typical botanist scene, peering uh, at a little exposed area on the rocks where some more fantastic plants to look for. This orchid looks at a glance a bit like our common spotted orchid, but in fact, it's uh, the Eastern counterpart of it. So it is um, Dactyloriza, but Sacifera, the, uh, and it has a much larger spurs on the flowers and a, a longer lip. So similar in some respects, but a, actually a different species. 
And of course, butterflies abound many species of fritillaries and there's so much source of nectar for them. This honeywort is one of the species which often attracts them. I mentioned earlier on that it is very well organized because it's a ski resort. There are roads and trails and very well done, but also set out for hiking and there are information boards. Quite often they'll have a, a panel inset in English just to give you a summary of what's there. So it's really all quite user friendly. And very often, of course, as you can see, lovely blue skies. Of course, we're there in midsummer, so long days, reasonable temperatures and reasonably dry underfoot. But there's a certain amount of walking here in the mountains. We do go up quite high, but on recognized trails. And that means we get to see interesting plants and another of these knapweed relatives, another in a Balkan endemic. By Balkan endemic, I mean it would be perhaps Bulgaria, possibly northern Greece, Serbia, Romania, perhaps, in the right sort of habitats in that region. And this lovely little um, Daphne, highly scented. Daphne related to the, the scarce one that we get in Britain. We're getting quite high up now. We're almost at the tree line where, um, where the mountain pine over, uh, takes over from the Bosnian pine lower down and the spreading juniper and lots of bare exposures of rock and really quite boggy areas in places. And so the plants change from being forest or woodland plants to being true alpines, this little dianthus uh, growing out of a little crevice in the rocks and the Aubrieta gracilis, another one, compact, a cushion forming, typical many alpine flowers. We could go on all night just talking about the alpines uh, because there are so many there and you can soon uh, get a really good list. One thing of course is that wherever there's been a, um, a little bit of a, an ice slip or if perhaps there's a, a stony riverbed, things sometimes get washed down from high up and so you get a chance to look at alpine flowers lower down without having to go up onto impossible crags in the mountains. But it is very good if you're into your alpines and the two or three days spent there, you'll soon get a really good list uh, of some interesting plants. Um, but for bird watchers, of course, lots to look at. You can take your binoculars, even when you're botanizing. The ring oozle is a breeding bird there. In fact, really quite close to Sophia, we find ring oozles in the edge of the forest around one of the, the chairlifts. And up here in the mountains, quite a common sight at this time of year, usually feeding young. And also bullfinches high up there above the tree line. There are plenty of thistles and dandelions and things with lots of seeds at that time of year. So some familiar birds, um, as well as some more unusual things like the chamois, um, a good habitat for those. And being a national park, all of this is, of course, properly protected. So still lingering around on the edge of the tree line, uh, the tops of the pines, when the trees are lower, of course, we can see the treetops more easily and crossbills are quite common there. And very occasionally we get to see them really quite close to if we're on a steep uh, mountain path somewhere looking across at the treetops, they're at eye level. So a typical mountain trail, very well waymarked. And we obviously, we do stay in a group, but if you were to linger behind, couldn't really get lost because the, the trails are marked and, and pretty well worn. So uh, this one, the Vichren Trail, takes us up to about six and a half thousand feet in easy stages with lots of fascinating plants, a Balkan version of butterwort. We have butterworts in Britain, but this is a, a Balkan endemic. And this little genista, tiny, tiny little relative of Dyer's greenweed. And a boggy flush here where plants like these lovely gentians grow. Uh, there's Pyrenaica, strangely, although we're not in the Pyrenees, and a little um, yellow star of Bethlehem. Some of those are a bit tricky to identify, so tentative identification there. A mountain lake, which some years when we go has ice flows on it, uh, the remains of ice that has slumped down, clear at the moment, someone being very brave and paddling there, and it's a home to frogs. This, in fact, is a common frog trying to turn this into other species, but very high up, and usually at that time of year, we've just got the first tadpoles, but lovely plants like the Primula farinosa growing around the margins and the elder flowered orchid as well in the damp margins. Here we've got uh, some ice, so sort of like a mini tongue of a glacier, which has eroded and brought a lot of material down to the mountains. Good spot for a picnic and a breather. And as the snow melts, retreats, all these late spring flowers appear. Now I know it's midsummer, but of course we're high up in the mountains now, we're many thousands of feet up. And so we get to see spring flowers as well, 
by gaining a bit of altitude, this lovely crocus valucensis, and the soldanella, little um, snowbell, also peeping through just at the edge of the snowmelt. Each year is slightly different. So some years we have to go a bit higher, some years the things come down to meet us. So we've been here in this area around Sofia and the Rila Mountains and the final stop just down here, the Rodope Mountains, almost in Greece. These mountains on the border with Greece. And the final place we stay uh, is this um, hotel in a stunning location. But this was built for the workers, not the communist rulers in the past, but for all the workers who are entitled to two weeks holiday a year. And many of them would go here. The most amazing location from the windows there. You can look across the road, Dopia Mountains, and see the mountains of Greece in the background, right out in the countryside. They have night jars um, calling their night and um, amazing flowers in the, in the grounds. So just by wandering through the trees, things like the violet limador um, is easily found. And the yellow bird's nest, a very strange plant, not an orchid, but a, a saprophytic plant. Devil's Throat is a real tourist attraction. This is a gorge where we go to see this plant, Habalia rhodopensis, the only site in Europe for this um, relative of the African violet. You may have something like this as a pot plant, um, but this one, Habalia, grows here in this gorge. It's permanently drenched in spray. Now, usually at this point, I've got a, a short telephoto lens on because we can't get across the gorge to see it. We can almost reach out and touch the plant, but it's protected by being in this gorge. And apologies for repeating what we saw in Romania, but this is a, a known site for the wall creeper. On one occasion, I had to drag the botanists away and make them look up, look over your heads. So with a short telephoto lens, there was a wall creeper. We couldn't hear it over the thundering roar of the waterfall, but obviously plenty of food for it. So this is a well-known site. So birders don't feel neglected on this uh, summer flowers of the Balkans trip. Campanula lingulata, a lovely bellflower, one of my favourites. In the same place. So rich meadows where you shouldn't really tread. We sometimes tiptoe our way through if we can find a little animal trail and look for plants like this green winged orchid and then the bug orchid. And then if we're very lucky, occasionally a hybrid. I think this one is yet to be named. Um, but see, there's plenty to see, even if you don't fancy doing some of the mountain trails. The lowlands are very rich habitats indeed. The Romans got there, of course, as they traveled across Europe and built this well, amongst many bridges. And this Roman bridge is a good site for things like greater butterfly orchid, really a good place to just sit and watch a little river. This once marked the border between um, Bulgaria and northern Turkey. The Balkan copper butterflies like habitats like this, slightly humid, plenty of their food plants, the dock relative food plants, and plenty of nectar sources as well. Really stunning butterflies, larger than our small copper, of course unmistakable. Again, a typical nature trek scene. You hardly dare tread or certainly not lie down too much, but we're studying some orchids in another of these wonderful wet meadows, the heart-flowered orchid and Bamaniana, no English name for this, a very large species of marsh orchid. And needless to say, they hybridize so you have great fun trying to sort out the hybrids. But just to finish off quickly, this is a building plot, a, um, an undeveloped building plot in Bansko, and we could find the same sort of things often if we have a roadside stop at a petrol station somewhere, wander off. They're just amazing things to see, um, this crown vetch and verbascums, mullines. Bulgaria is noted for them. There are many species and they're all in full flower this time of year. And of course, attracting insects like forester moths and various uh, beetles and bugs. They were really rich habitat for entomologists. So sorry, a rather abrupt ending. I've noticed my time is coming up. So it's certainly it's a botany trip. It's time to be there at the peak of flowering in Bulgaria. Usually the weather is pretty good, as you can see, except maybe high up in the mountains. But botany isn't quite your thing. Plenty of birds, butterflies other things to see. So thank you very much. I'll hand back to Sarah now. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was fantastic. And thank you very much, Jason, as well, both to uh, brilliant talks. Now, folks, we're just going to go to uh, a five minute break now. So you can pop to the loo, get yourself a top up of your tea, coffee or wine. Um, and uh, we'll be back in five minutes. 
Right, folks, welcome back. And I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, David Phillips, who's taking us to Hungary. Over to you, David. Thank you, Sarah. Good evening, everyone. Just bear with me while I just share my screen and presentation. Okay, so uh, I'm going to uh, talk this evening about Hungary. Um, it's a country that we do a number of different tours to. Uh, last um, uh, spring, I spoke about our Hungary in Autumn trip uh, during our slideshows then. So you can look back at the, um, uh, the program that we did then and, and, and listen to that if you wish. But tonight I'm going to talk about Hungary in Spring. So if I just advance my slide and tell you a little bit about Hungary to start with, it's a country in the uh, uh, eastern part of Central Europe, uh, highlighted there in blue. Um, and uh, as you can see from the, the text there, it's got a population of about 10 million people and an area of 93,000 square kilometres. That puts it at a little bit larger than Scotland or, or Ireland. There's a medium sized country uh, in Eastern Europe there. And looking at a, a physical map, of Eastern Europe, you can see here that it's surrounded. I point to it, in fact, with my, my cursor, so that you can see there, uh, Hungary. This country is uh, surrounded by mountainous country. Uh, indeed, it, it's, it's pretty much uh, enclosed by the Carpathian Mountains that we've heard uh, Andrew and Jason speaking about already uh, to the north and east and the Alps to the west and to the south are the uh, Dinaric Alps. In, uh, down there in Croatia and, and former uh, Yugoslav republics. So it's actually uh, it's, say, surrounded by mountains, but it's a very flat as a whole. It, as a general rule, it's a very flat country. And in fact, looking at this map, you might not surprise you that uh, in, the, in, in the deep past, about 10 million years ago, uh, it was actually completely covered by a lake and uh, that, that was encompassed by, by those mountains. And as a result of that uh, lake or inland sea rim, because it's so large, it actually has a very, um, a very saline soils throughout much of the, the flat plains of Hungary. And those saline soils uh, have, uh, and, and alkali soils have uh, meant that, that the plant growth is, is somewhat inhibited and there aren't really many trees. So they, it's, it's a country of flat plains or steppes. And, and the steppes really are the, the, the westernmost extension, you could say, of the, the steppe country that it, uh, exists right across southern Russia and Central Asia uh, and here in, into Europe. Now, all our tours start and finish in the capital, Budapest. Uh, this is a couple of shots here of, of the capital city, a very attractive city, um, city of two halves. It's bisected by the Danube the major waterway, one of the major waterways of Europe, with the Buda side on the, the sort of near side on that top picture, the hilly side, if you like, where it's got a, a beautiful old castle. Um, and then across the Danube is the Pest side, where the Parliament building is, and a massive, very flat area. But it's a, an attractive city. Our tours don't really spend any time, or don't spend any time in the city. However, the reason for my putting this slide in is that uh, many clients uh, opt to uh, spend a day or so, or a couple of days, three days perhaps, uh, in the capital, either before or after the tour. And this is something that we can arrange uh, for the flights to um, suit you so that you can have a bit of time in the city you can uh, join the tour either after you spend a little break there and then taking in some of the culture or, or indeed go there at the end of a trip. Quite a, a, an interesting option for people. Now, as I say, we do, uh, we do a number of different tours, five different tours. Uh, I'm going to talk about Hungary in spring this trip, uh, during this evening, um, and that, that is a tour that runs in, in late April, early May, but we have tours that focus on butterflies in, in, in June. We have a Hungary in summer trip, which is in August. The Mayfly Emergence, this was a tour that I spoke about back in, uh, in, in uh, uh, spring of this year, uh, but that actually runs in a June. You might think a Mayfly trip should be in May, but in fact, Mayflies typically emerge in June. So, uh, so that tour is, is geared to uh, focus on, on this amazing emergence of, of, of mayfly on the rivers there in Hungary. Uh, and then in September, we do a, a trip which is to see all the small mammals of Hungary, bats and, and, uh, and other small mammals. Uh, and then in autumn, that's our October trip, that uh, focuses again, focuses probably more on birds because it's a time when 
uh, a lot of the returning migrants come back that have bred further north, make their way back through Hungary, so lots of cranes arriving. But anyway, I talk about uh, all those tours, but, but Hungary in spring is what I'm going to focus on now. And this tour has three, uh, three um, centres. We fly into Budapest, so if we look at the map there, uh, we fly into Budapest now. Sometimes we do it in reverse, but uh, I'm going to talk this evening about the tour in, in, in if you were to take the, the normal route, which would be to go first to the Ishkenshag National Park down here south uh, of Budapest, uh, and then over to the Autobarge National Park, and then up to the Zemplin Hills. We spent two nights in the Ishkenshag, two nights in Autobarge, and three nights in the Zemplin Hills. And uh, the Ishkenshag area and the Autobarge area are areas of, of plain, uh, of steppe country. They're very similar in some respects, but certain species are more predominant in, in one than the other. So they're definitely it's worth visiting both areas. The Zemplin Hills are, are obviously hills uh, and therefore have a, a different habitat and different uh, species that we go in search of on that uh, tour. And the tour is principally a bird watching tour, but of course, uh, as with the other countries you've heard about this evening, uh, there are so many other things to see, lots of insects life, lots of plant life as well, but it's birds predominantly that the spring trip focuses on. So this Kiskenshag National Park, which is, as I say, just south of Budapest, we drive for about an hour and a half from the airport and we arrive in this uh, flat steppe country with saline pools. On the way, we'll be seeing white storks that will be, again, doing this sort of beak clacking as the breeding season is getting underway, sitting on nests. Uh, this sort of wonderful sight of, of southern and eastern Europe during that spring period. Collared pratting coals might be flying around. It, it's, a, it's a lovely area uh, for, for birding and we stay, uh, usually we stay in this, this, man, this house, a uh, really lovely sort of hotel, uh, right in the centre, horse paddocks all around and, uh, and, and it's really centrally located within the National Park. Some of the species that we'd uh, be particularly keen to see and very likely to see uh, on most days during the, our trips here are, are species which have migrated up from Africa to the European rollers. These are the sort of the tropical uh, birds, if you like, the colourful uh, birds that we would hope to see. The, the European rollers, the, the hoopoe, the hoopoe uh, European bee eater, and, and if we're lucky we'll see golden oriole as well. We may see these birds throughout the trip in different places, but I just put them in at this first point. Uh, golden oriole, uh, often more tricky to see because they're often uh, high up in trees in amongst the leaves uh, and more tricky to find but the others uh, on power lines and, and you saw on the ground um, finding food so uh, you know, these are birds which during the springtime you're very likely to encounter. Uh, perhaps the, the key species that ornithologists love to see when they come to Hungary and particularly this area is the Saker falcon it's the uh, national bird of Hungary uh, and, and just looking at the, uh, the map there in the bottom left this sort of shows, as I'm going to show with a number of other species, how birds which are breeding really across the steppe country of, of, of south, south of Central Asia uh, find a, a breeding territory within Hungary as well. And you can see, in fact, the green area of that map is where the Saker falcon breeds. So right across sort of Kazakhstan and Russia and Ukraine, but Hungary as well. Uh, and it's because it has this very similar uh, steppe uh, area habitat. Uh, and over on the right, uh, um, Jason showed a picture of the Suslik or uh, 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 the, the ground squirrel there. And we see those as well in Hungary. And they are, as well as being a victim of the polecat, uh, as, as Jason said, the Saker falcon is also a, a bird that will we'll, uh, uh, have them as a, a meal. So um, yeah, definitely uh, those poor things are, are, need to keep their eyes and wits about them uh, for, for predators of all sorts. Similarly, the red-footed falcon, again, a, a breeder across much of the steppe country uh, of, of Asia, uh, finds its home in Hungary and, and Europe, uh, sorry, Hungary is actually a, a real stronghold uh, for the European, uh, uh, the European numbers of this red-footed falcon. So the lovely male there, top left and, and female on the right, uh, beautiful birds. They uh, take um, grasshoppers and dragonflies on the wing very often and feed feed on the wing uh, and you see them flying around often in, in numbers they'll, they'll feed in, in groups so a, lo a lovely species to see and, and fairly commonly seen on those steppe countries on, on the ground uh, we have great bustards um, uh, are, are 
perhaps the key bird that what people want to see there. Uh, and um, they're, they're well, probably better seen in the Kishkin Shag than any other area of Hungary. Uh, but also uh, we see lots of uh, uh, other birds such as rose-colored starlings and stone curlews, uh, other sort of steppe birds out there or, or in Kishkin Shag. But we move on from there onto the Autobarge. Uh, it's probably the most famous area uh, of uh, Hungary for its, uh, for its nature. Again, a, a sort of area of flat plain of steppe country, not thought, not really very uh, good for uh, growing crops because again, it's uh, saline. And, uh, but, but they have these gray cattle there that are uh, an ancient uh, race of, of, of cows that obviously bred for, for, for meat. Uh, and they have these uh, water, um, water sort of uh, irrigation sort of uh, uh, pumps to be able to get the water up to the surface. But this flat area of land uh, also has a number of what we call the fish ponds. Uh, now the fish ponds themselves were uh, dug out during, principally during World War I, when there were a lot of uh, prisoners of war in Hungary and they were, this area which is not particularly good for growing crops, it was thought that if we dug out, or if they dug out these uh, ponds, that, uh, that they could stock them with fish and that, that would be a, a good, meat, good source uh, of, of agriculture and money for the, for the local people. But those same fish ponds have become a fantastic site for, for birders. And uh, that's really where we probably focus our attention in the autobarge. Lots of heron species. So you have the lovely squacko heron there and the, the purple heron and great, uh, great white egrets, uh, black crown night herons. So a lot of different species of, of heron in and around the reed beds uh, uh, in those fish ponds. And, and in the reeds as well, we have some other fantastic birds to see. Uh, blue throat, penduline tits with their, their lovely sort of nests building that they, they do in those sort of spherical nests. Uh, bearded tits, bearded tits and, and, and a great reed warbler there in the bottom right hand corner, much larger than our, our reed warbler, um, but uh, quite a striking bird to see. But some beautiful birds there to see in the in the autobarge area, as well as, of course, lots of duck species as well. Originous duck that Jason mentioned over in Romania. You see good numbers of those. And at certain times, there's lots of raptors about as well, white-tailed eagles, uh, as well as the, the ones that I, I've already mentioned. And birding aside, there's a good number of different uh, insect species as well to see there. So, so uh, here we have the, down the bottom right, the, uh, the scarce swallowtail. Uh, there as and, and, and the southern festoon is the butterfly on the right. The, the absolutely lovely, lovely species that uh, are, are commonly seen during the, the spring period uh, in Hungary. So from uh, from the Autobarge, which is this sort of area here uh, on the near the sort of Tisha River, we head north up into the hills for three nights in the Zemplin Hills, which are up on the north part of Hungary on the border with Slovakia. Uh, with, uh, Slovakia. Uh, and not far from the U Ukrainian border as well. And these hills are, are largely covered by deciduous forest, of beech trees there, but there are a lot of clearings as well, a lot of meadows, lots of vineyards um, and scrub areas as well. So it's, it's quite a, a, a rich habitat for woodland birds. And it, it's probably uh, one of the, the key birds that we go to see in this area are, are, are the Ural owl, uh, this beautiful, beautiful owl and eagle owls as well are also seen in this area, and and uh, then lots of uh, some well-known sites for those. So uh, it, it, it's seen on on mo most of the trips. Um, all, all, also, we we, we have uh, the uh, it's a nationally, sorry, internationally important uh, breeding area for uh, the eastern imperial eagle. So uh, this is a, a species, again, which um, prefers steppe habitat. Again, I show you a very similar map to the distribution showing how this, this bird, which you won't find further west really than, uh, uh, than, than the plains of places like Hungary, um, but it breeds right across the uh, Asian steppe. Uh, but it is, as I say, it has an internationally important uh, breeding site in, in the, uh, in the sort of Zemplin Hills area. And in the woodlands around the Zentlin Hills, we have a lot of good woodland species. This uh, beautiful little long-tailed tit is actually the, uh, the, the northern uh, subspecies, Cordatus uh, subspecies of, of uh, long-tailed long tit with that very white head. Ours, of course, has a, a quite dark area around the sort of eye, but this has a much whiter head. And, and some, many of these are seen 
uh, in and around the, the northeast of Hungary, and, and really their range extends further north right up into sort of Scandinavia. Um, and this is one of the further south areas to see them. Um, over on the, the bottom left, you have a picture of a collared flycatcher, uh, again, commonly seen in the Zemplin Hills area, um, but perhaps uh, as well as the owls and the raptors for which the area is very, very well known. The other key species that we look for are woodpeckers, and there are eight resident species of, uh, of woodpeckers in Hungary. Most of them are all found within the Zemplin Hills area. So you have the white-backed woodpecker, which is perhaps the most sought after of, of the woodpeckers in that area. Black woodpecker as well, it's not one of the pictures, but uh, grey-headed there in the middle, uh, the middle spotted uh, woodpecker over on the right. So it's, uh, in fact, when I say eight different uh, species, if you include Rhineck as well, which is a woodpecker, uh, there's actually nine species of woodpecker. So it, it's a really a good spot if that's your, your target, uh, target family to see. Um, but it's all in all, it's a, it's a wonderful country. And I hope, uh, I hope the photographs here have whetted your appetite to, to visit Hungary. Uh, we could, of course, talk a lot more about it, but uh, I will now hand you over uh, to, uh, to Richard. Uh, who will talk about, so I'll close down my, my screen if you just bear with me, and hand you over to Richard who is going to talk about Poland. Thank you very much for your time. You're still on mute, Richard. Good evening, everyone. Hopefully you can see my screen. Um, Poland, well, I'm the fourth person to talk to you this evening. So uh, have I got any woodpecker shots? Yeah, I have. But anyway, I think woodpeckers are the best thing in the world. So that's fine by me. What I want to talk to you about now is Poland, which is a country I've been going to for Nature Trek for um, a number of years now. I think I've done about 15 or 16 visits to Poland. It's absolutely fabulous. Um, and I'm just going to take you on a, a tour to the main um, places that <clears throat> we do on the uh, most of the trips. Most of the wildlife action is towards the eastern side of Poland. So let's start off with the map. You've got Warsaw just to the uh, right of centre there in this very square, large country. And the first thing we're going to do is head east um, right to the Belarus border, to Beovesia Forest. And then after that, we're going to go to Biebsha Marshes. So we've got a lot of uh, species to look for in the forest, and then we're going to marshland to see some slightly different things. So once you get out of Warsaw on a typical tour, um, you will, well, in fact, before you, before you land, you'll notice that the agri agriculture is very different. Um, it's uh, there's a lot of strip agriculture still, so there's not many large fields, especially in the far in the far east of the country. And seeing uh, horse-drawn uh, farm farm work is not that unusual. It's getting more and more um, unusual to see, but it's something you can expect to see as we drive east. But it's a fair journey. There's um, you know it's about a two and a half hour flight from the UK, so it's not a bad flight. Um, and then we have a, a few hours on the road, which we stop. At, uh, I think one of the other speakers mentioned fish ponds. Um, Poland's full of fish ponds. Um, and these are massive lakes covered in reeds, full of bitterns, marsh harriers, white tailed eagles, etc. And it's a great place for us to drive out uh, and spend a bit of time here. We, I think, our guide there, our local guide, fantastic local guide, um, is looking for little crake. So that's a species that you might see in the reed beds here. Um, they're not particularly um, wary of people, they just live in reeds, they're very hard to see, but if you do see them, you see them very well. But the thing he's actually doing, I think, is holding one of these, and I think uh, we saw a yellow-bellied toad earlier, this is fire-bellied toad, so these, these make a, a lovely chorus when you're going through some of these wetlands in Eastern Europe, and our guide was kind enough to uh, catch one of these to show us this incredible amphibian. And then some of the things that you're perhaps familiar with in the UK, uh, this is redneck grebe, but we don't often see redneck grebes in summer plumage like this. So this is a breeding redneck grebe with a lovely yellow base to the bill. And uh, they breed here, black neck grebes breed here. You can see Slavonian grebes, great crested, little. It's just absolutely amazing. 
And then the other thing that you might see, and others have mentioned of this species, a penduline tit, um, but at least we've got a photograph of a nest this time. Um, and that's one of the things that alert you to its presence. Um, that's why, you know, it's such a, a famous and well-known nest, but it's quite an incredible thing for a tiny bird to make. And penduline tits make this very thin, long uh, whistle, um, which alerts you to their presence. And if you're very lucky, you'll hear that. And uh, you might see the, the little tiny thing. It looks like a tiny red back shrike, I always think. But we'll carry on our journey and we're getting to Belle of Asia Forest. And this is our hotel. No great surprise to know that this hotel is made of wood. A lot of the buildings here are made of wood for obvious reasons, right in the middle of the forest. Bio of Asia Forest is colossal. Um, in terms of where the, most of the woodland is, most of it's in Belarus, and there's quite a small bit in Poland, but the bit in Poland is still very massive in European terms. But Waymupka Guest House is a place where I've stayed for a number of years. It's actually not a particularly old building, and it's put together by um, members of OTOP, which is their, one of the bird organizations in Poland. And these, uh, the people there, it's, it's a lovely, relaxed, informal place to stay, fantastic cooking. They'll look after you, you sit around a, a communal table, they'll bring food out of the kitchen. Uh, one of the things that's particularly nice is that there's a fridge full of beer and you just help yourself to the beer and there's a pad and a pen and you tick off how many beers you've had and you pay for it when you leave. So, um, I mean, that's that's not a highlight. It's just, I don't know why I mentioned it, to be honest. Anyway, the, one of the best things about this is that you walk out of here across the road, you're in some fantastic habitat. So up the street, you'll see white storks. We've seen them on other talks tonight. Um, quite an old nest here. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bird that makes you realize that you're, you're across the channel in, into sort of Eastern Europe. Garden birds are quite smart too. Now we think of red start as perhaps more of a woodland bird in this country, um, but they'll, they'll breed in the, the nice gardens in Bay of Asia village. Um, so this is a, a male red start and on the buildings you'll get black red starts and there'll be lots of song coming from the bushes. And uh, <clears throat> this is um, a thrush nightingale. So it's the Eastern version of nightingale, slightly duller, still pretty smart. I mean, nightingales sound good. Thrush nightingales sound good as well. There's not a great deal of difference between the song um, and they're quite common. So although they're quite a skulking bird, we will do our best to find one and hopefully get views like this for the thrush nightingale. And this is something you can see from your hotel. Um, so it's a nice garden bird to see. On the doorstep, uh, and just uh, say across the road and through a band of trees, you're into Palace Park, which is a great bit of open parkland. And the thing with this is that it's quite a good place to go bird watching because thick forest can be quite hard. A lot of the forest is quite thick. So this gives you some nice spaces and a little bit of um, extra sort of wood and edge habitat. And I've seen beaver swim across this lake. Um, there's reed beds here for marsh warblers. Great reed warblers will sing here. But let's talk about woodpeckers. That is what it's all about, isn't it? So this is lesser spotted woodpecker. Uh, this is the one that's the size of a house sparrow, absolutely tiny. Uh, and it may seem quite an unusual thing to see a woodpecker on reeds, but this is quite a normal thing for lesser spotted woodpeckers to do. Um, and uh, this was a very kind woodpecker that did this on our first day of a, of a trip that we did. Um, we've seen this in other talks. This is the grey-headed woodpecker. Now, the thing with grey-headed woodpeckers is it's it's superficially like a green woodpecker, um, very very similar size. I um, and you you'll know that the green woodpecker's got a is well known for its call, its yaffle. And I'd say that grey-headed woodpecker is like a sad green woodpecker. So you've got your green woodpecker that goes. <whistles> this one is just like. So he's, he's just a bit mournful, but a fantastic thing. So you hear that slightly sad green woodpecker, look out for a gray headed woodpecker. The squirrels are red. That's a nice thing. It's a nice, nice mammal to see. And on this, these trips are generally um, quite early spring. And on the last few trips I've done to Bay of Asia village, waxwings are passing through. There's a lot of food. There's a lot of 
um, mistletoe. Um, there's a lot of budding trees, a lot of insects. So these are moving through feeding and they're, they're quite a regular bird at this time of the year. So it's uh, obviously good to see a uh, bird that we associate with the winter, but the, here they are in spring. But the actual purpose of our stay here is to visit the, the, the woodland. And this is a sort of view you get just outside the village. So this is an early morning visit to an area where there's woodlarks sitting on the trees, singing, there's hawfinches flying over, um, and red deer in the fields. And that band of trees you can see in the distance is Belarus. So we're actually going to have a little look around some of the, the woodland habitats now. As you go into the woodland, uh, you pass through meadowlands. So as you'll probably know that forest doesn't actually mean trees, it means a mixture of uh, wooded areas and open areas of meadowland. And the traditionally uh, managed meadow areas are where you expect to see lesser spotted eagle. Um, and lesser spotted eagles depend on traditional harvest methods to, to feed. Um, and uh, this is something we'll look for as we walk into the forest. And this is the real special thing with, with uh, the trip to Bay of Asia. This is a visit to the core area or strict reserve. And this is an area that hasn't been managed for uh, 100 years. I think it's 100 years next year. I think it's 1922, the last time there was any management of it. But it has been studied, scientifically studied extremely well. And the guy on the left there, or his father, will take us on a, a trip uh, in here for a few hours in early one morning to show us and explain all about the uh, the work that goes on. They study dead wood, um, they look at the comp uh, they, how the, the woodland's made up, they tell you about the botany. It's fantastic and you can't go in there without a guide and you can't take any motorized vehicles in there. So all you'll see in there is horse-drawn um, vehicles or, um, or, or, or cycles. Uh, but if you don't want to take your cycle in there, you can use one of these rustic cycle uh, racks. And this is the sort of scene you'll get. So you have tracks like this. The thing I like to point out with this, this um, uh, photograph is that the, the lowest part of the path here is in the middle. That's because that's where the horses go. So the traction is the thing that wears the road, not the wheels. The wheels in a car wear the road because um, obviously that's where the traction is. But with a horse-drawn carriage, it's the center part where the animal goes that wears the road. So that's lower than the rest. Well, I think it's interesting anyway. I point it out to everyone when we go there, but uh, maybe it's just me. Well, what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for the special birds. Now, collared flycatcher is the commonest flycatcher. There's four species of flycatcher here, and it's the commonest one. It tells you you're in somewhere special when collared flycatcher is the commonest. And this is one by its nest hole. The other real treat for people is to see the red-breasted flycatcher. So this is a, a super bird. I mean, they, they give themselves away by their song at this time of year, which is kind of handy in forest, but what a, what a beautiful bird that is. And this is another woodpecker. So this is the big uh, black and white woodpecker, the, the middle up the uh, white-backed woodpecker. So it's got streaks on its breast. It's got a lot of uh, collection of white, white feathering on its back that gives it its name, but it's bigger than great spotted, which we're much more familiar with. It's scenically very beautiful. It's quite a flat part of the world. Uh, the houses are, are very traditional, very, very old, uh, and, and obviously made of wood, but uh, it's a lovely part of the world to, to, to spend some time. Uh, but while we're here, we'll make sure we go to the different types of forest. So spruce forest is very important for a bird that you've seen already tonight, the nutcracker. And nutcracker is thankfully very kind and sits on top of trees and makes a horrible noise. So if you hear something, it's something like a something like that, you'll know it's a nutcracker and you just have to scan lots of trees and you'll, you'll hear it and maybe see it. But the real special woodpecker um, is uh, for, for spruce forest is the three-toed. Um, three-toed, um, not, not particularly easy to see its toes unless you're very, very close, but it has yellow on it, which is the only woodpecker with yellow on it in Europe. Um, so that's the three-toed woodpecker, likes damp spruce forest. And we've already seen black woodpecker, so I'm not going to dwell on these shots because the other photographs were quite big, but I will show you this one. This is a uh, black woodpecker's nest hole in my hand, just to show you how big they are. I didn't cut the tree down, this was fallen, I just thought I'd take this photograph to show you, but pretty impressive bird, about the size of a jackdaw, so quite impressive. 
not the only thing to leave marks on trees. So we hope to see beaver and you can see them. You can certainly see beaver lodges, but here's a classic um, a view of uh, what a, a beaver does to a tree. But one of the things we'll do in one of the evenings is we'll have uh, our dinner at a slightly later time or earlier time so that we can be out in the forest at dusk, not very far away from our hotel, but we'll go out at dusk and we'll, um, uh, we'll go with our guide to a certain part of the forest and the local guides are absolutely fantastic. Uh, really good. They have the knowledge, they know where the nesting holes are for woodpeckers and things, and they know where birds like pygmy owls are going to be. So just imagine the scene, you get somewhere at dusk and the guide stands in front of you and he goes like this, he goes. And then you're quiet. And then he does it again. And then something responds. And then this thing flies in. Absolutely incredible. This is a tiny bird, a tiny owl. So this feeds on things like blue tits and great tits. Um, First time I saw one of these, I actually moved along the branches of my telescope with my uh, binoculars and I went past it because I didn't realize how small it was. It's the size of a, it's not much bigger than a tennis ball. Um, fantastic thing, so pygmy owl. Not just uh, birds to see, of course. Um, one of the most famous inhabitants of uh, Bio of Asia forest is European bison. And again, local knowledge would tell us that there's some meadows that you can go and see these fantastic animals in if you're very lucky um, and this was a this was one of several in a in a meadow outside just outside the village but I wanted to show you this one because this was the last trip I did two years ago now uh, and we'd walked unsuccessfully hadn't seen bison and a, lang lo a local uh, came out and said have you seen the bison uh, this was through a translator of course I said have you seen the bison he said, no, well, there's one here, he says, and it killed my horse in the winter. Come over here, follow me. So we followed him about 50 metres off the path. This brown lump just stood up and he says, right, we stop here. We don't go any further. He doesn't want you to go any further. And then it looked at you. And that's the view that we got. And, uh, you know, not, not, not at all dangerous. Just do what the locals say. They know. Don't go any further than that. And we walked away and left him in peace. What a fantastic thing to see. But let's move further north now. We'll just go to Biebsha Marshes. I've got a few slides of this wetland area. It's a massive wetland area. Biebsha Marshes is uh, just colossal. It's a narrow water uh, river, um, and it's large, large areas that you can view from sort of high land either side of it, and various places you can go and have a look. What it's really famous for are its flocks, clouds of terns. So this is a lovely white-winged black tern. And whitening black terns are probably one of the most beautiful terns you can see when they're adult. When they're immatures, they're quite really quite ugly. But but look at that! Isn't that superb? So you get um, whitening black terns, you get black terns, and you also get whiskered terns. And this is a that's the three marsh terns that they're called. So whiskered tern doesn't actually have whiskers, of course. It's got a dark belly and a black cap, and it looks like it's got a large moustache there, which gives it its name. The other thing that it's really good for here is breeding waders. So in England, we have a very small population of black-tailed godbits. Uh, they're at the ooze washes and the neen washes. And black-tailed godbits breed in much bigger numbers in, in, in habitats that are as vast as uh, the uh, Biebsha marshes. And here's a black-tailed godbit uh, uh, coming into land. And the other bird that we see, we're quite familiar with in the UK, but doesn't breed is the rough. The ruffs are fantastic. They're all sorts of different colours, but it's a bird that lecks. So the males will dance around and impress the females. And they're, they're incredibly interesting to watch. So you can see this sort of behaviour in our spring trips to Poland. So you'll see some of these birds in the middle have white ruffs. And here's another version of it, a very loose feathering of a ruff. They have these sort of extra uh, bulky feathers around the neck and upper breast. And this one's got black. They can be ginger, they can be white, absolutely incredible birds, but they will lek. And when you're talking about birds that lek, this is the other one that you must see. This is a great snipe. And these are taken at dusk, so these are very hard birds to photograph, but great snipes lek as well. So they do a very strange jumping up and down dance, sticking their tails and their wings up, showing the white feathering. And they make an odd noise, a bit like this. It's sort of a 
something like that. And if you've never heard one, you won't know if that's a good impression or not, but I think it's it's really quite good. Anyway, so this is a great snipe. And there's another great snipe uh, doing in the middle of its lecking. So really tremendous thing to see. But again, you have to be there at dusk. Um, so that's something we'll put a bit of effort into on these trips. And finally, what we end up with is another bird that you're probably familiar with of Eastern Europe. It's a very famous bird, the corncrake. Um, sadly, very, very um, restricted in Britain into our Western, Western Isles now. But in areas where there are vast numbers of wet meadows um, uh, you, and, and lush, lush wet meadows, um, you can expect to hear corncrake, which is <laughs> and uh, if you eventually try and track down the noise, you may be lucky enough to see one. Um, it's not that easy, but it can happen. Uh, first one I ever saw when it came out and stood on a clod of earth in a field and, and called. So I was very, very lucky to see that. But most of the time you hear them, but a, a fantastic, um, fantastic, fantastic bird to see. So I will leave you with a view that's looking across to Belarus. And that's an early morning uh, misty shot walking out from Bio of Asia forest um, across to uh, the uh, core area that uh, that we walk around with a guide. So I hope you've enjoyed the uh, whistle stop tour of Poland. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Richard. That was, that was fantastic. I'm sure if any people are watching, you've got cats joining them, their ears will have pricked up while you've been doing those bird impersonations, <laughs> which uh, certainly made me smile. Uh, very good. And thank you also to David. Uh, right, folks, we can now take some questions. Um, if any of you would like to fire questions at our leaders, you are very welcome to. Now is the time to do it. So we've had one come in. Uh, from Tim Arnold, who is asking, what material does the penduline tit use to make its nest? So uh, as I put the nest shot up, I should probably have a go answering that and other people can join in if I go wrong, but it's a little bit, a little bit like a long tail tit nest. It's quite a lot of it's held together with cobwebs, but the bulk of it is um, uh, reed mace and uh, lichen. So it's a sort of, um, uh, it's a mixture of those things. Um, uh, uh, to to disguise it in. I mean, it's hanging in a birch tree, I think, that one. So, um, yeah, anyone else want to add into that? <laughs> no, you've got the, the mm. nesting covered <laughs> right here. Uh, well, we've had, um, this is a question for all of you, a um, comment from Alan Woodward. Hi, Alan, nice to see you here again. Uh, he says, such great destinations. Uh, this is an impossible question to answer. You might all have a fight amongst yourself. Uh, which one is the best one for birding, uh, but particularly photographic opportunities? I did notice that there were some lovely Ural owl shots in those presentations. Would any of you like to put forward which one you think is particularly good for photographic opportunities? I mean, Jason, you know, when you're watching the bears from the hides, that is very good, isn't it? You've got a, a really good, I, I've sat in those hides photographing the, the bears in Romania and they, they can come incredibly close, can't they? Yeah, they can. Um, and as I mentioned, sometimes we're into double figures, so your sport for choice. And occasionally they do come very close to the hive, right in underneath. The problem, uh, I think Richard mentioned it a moment ago with the great snipe is um, low light. So it's difficult, difficult to get the shutter speeds. Uh, but if you're happy with the record shot, yeah, you can get some great shots. And occasionally we get uh, lesser spotted eagles and ravens and things joining us at the bear hides as well. But as you saw, my presentation was largely focused on birds. Um, so yes, it, it's an excellent place, the Danube and the Carpathians for birds, but you can see um, any of the Eastern European tours are, are yeah. Blessed. And often, often being out on a boat is a great platform to be on for taking photographs. I find I, I lead a lot of our cruises and I find that when you're approaching wildlife from a boat, they react differently and they're, they're less skittish than if you're approaching them on land. So you do have, it just lend itself a bit better to having better photographic opportunities if you want to, want to take photographs of uh, pelicans and things like that. And um, that's probably quite, quite a good option. Anyone else? Would, uh, would like to put forward good photographic opportunities for birds for the, the tours. 
Nope. Andrew's waving. <laughs> yes, in, in Bulgaria, it's called the flowers of the Balkans, but botanists potter about very slowly. We've got our noses down looking at things, but all the photographs I used are ones I took myself when I should have been looking at flowers. The opportunities just crop up and I usually have a maybe a short telephoto lens on. And a lot of the birds there um, are not chased by dogs or worried by people. And so things like the ring oozles breeding up in the mountains, um, I haven't put in photographs, but we have nutcrackers there as well. Just take the, the chance if you have a, a short telephoto lens with you, even when you're botanizing, all sorts of opportunities arise. We're out there for long days, it's summer, it's a quiet place, usually just a few of us around, people sort of behaving quietly. So there are always good opportunities if you can manage to carry maybe your macro lens for the plants, but uh, some bird photographic equipment as well. You should get some good opportunities, like the wall creeper, for example. Mm. Mm. Can't promise any of this, of course. Yeah. But the opportunities are there sometimes. I would say generally all four countries are fantastic for birding and um, they all got really, really good birding opportunities um, that we all run. We all tend to run trips to them at different times of the year for different species um, to focus on the key wildlife areas. Um, and, and like the leaders have been saying that sometimes you get really fortunate and you get a fantastic photo opportunity right in front of you. Um, and it's uh, kind of what you get on the day to some extent. It's really hard to say on any of these trips just mm exactly what kind of photographic opportunities you will get because they do tend to vary from year to year depending on how far advanced the season is on any trip um, and, and just I guess on on weather and, and local conditions at the time. Yeah and just talking about different seasons Alison someone has asked about um, Poland in the winter uh, as well. Yes, we do a trip to Poland in the winter, um, visits to similar kind of areas, um, but looking for, for slightly different wildlife, probably slightly more mammal focused than, than birding focused, but we are still looking for the eagles, um, particularly white-tailed eagles in the winter um, and other birds of prey as well. Great, thank you, Alison, for expanding on that. Um, I have a, a question for, um, for Richard. Richard, what's the food like? in uh, in poland um it, it well the the hotel we, we i mentioned the photograph uh, on that trip uh, it's 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 wonderful i mean the family cook the meal they bring it out i think that's the same in one or two other places mentioned by the other speakers um it's uh you know it's stuffed stuffed cabbage leaves a lot of, lot of uh, rice uh, a lot of vegetable a lot of cooked meat a lot of cheese uh, uh you know absolutely fantastic for vegetarians as well, because it's almost uh, the problem with hotels is they generally come along with buffet options, which means you eat twice as much as you should. That's what I find. Um, and and uh, there's no different in these sorts of places. There's so many things you can eat. Uh, I've been blown away by it. And I have to say that, uh, and I don't know if it's the same for the other countries. Uh, uh, um, I've been to uh, Bulgaria quite a lot as well as Poland. It's changed an awful lot. The catering side of things has got extremely good. When I first went in the 90s, you had to be at a hotel by six, otherwise the staff had gone home because that that they weren't really used to that sort of um, uh, um, uh, sort of a, a more Western uh, way of uh, sort of uh, catering for people. Uh, it's just got better and better. I found it wonderful. I'm sure the other leaders will agree. It's not not an issue. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I certainly I, I compare. <laughs> David, go on. No, I'm only going to say that, yeah, I, I would say that probably the, the same is true of Hungary. Um, I th think uh, a lot of people uh, have, have a view of Eastern Europe and, and the sort of generally the sort of food being you know, sort of historically borscht and things like that, you know, uh, and, and very, very meat heavy. But I think in, in recent years, things have, uh, have improved tremendously, the diversity of the menus and, and catering for, for Western sort of uh, diet and, and, and particularly, you know, vegetarianism and the like, where I think probably 20, 30 years ago, you'd have really struggled. It, it's not nearly so difficult now. And, and they, they do cater for, for all types. Thank you, David. Richard, I've got a woodpecker question for you. Um, it's not a very specific one, but <laughs> Kate Tanner is asking, do you see most of the woodpeckers on most trips? 
So uh, one thing I did want to say, and this is not one upmanship at all, but all 10 woodpeckers you get in Europe, you can see in Poland. So it beats <laughs> the other countries by one. Um, so just to be a bit more serious about it, because um, I, I do love woodpeckers, as you probably gathered, I think we all do. Um, the, uh, the, you would expect to see eight, or seven or eight on a trip. Green woodpecker is actually one of the hardest ones to see on the trip because you have to go to sort of slightly southern place. Uh, Syrian woodpecker um, is the bird you have to see when you're in Warsaw in a park because he doesn't get out east very, he doesn't get east that much. So, um, but I shouldn't worry about it. I mean, you walk out of that hotel, you, you Rhinex are right in front of you, um, but I think seven and sometimes eight. So I think seven is, is the bare minimum um, you'd get on one of these trips. It's, it's just woodpecker. In fact, the, the tour I used to do used to be called the Woodpecker Weekend. The most recent Poland tour used to be called the Woodpecker Weekend. It's now called Poland's Primeval Forests. Um, both good titles, but uh, yeah, you'll get your woodpeckers there. Woodpecker Weekend, that's a very nature type <laughs> title, isn't it? <laughs> Hungry is also very, very good, uh, yeah, and, and very frequently we do see all, all nine that, that, that are possible uh, in Hungary. In fact, uh, a lot of our tours in Hungary are led by Derek Gorman, who uh, uh, has written many a, many a book on, on woodpeckers, and he knows, he knows the sites for all of these particular species. So if that's your thing, then, then you know, you can be as, as assured as you can be of, of, of seeing of getting a really good selection of woodpeckers there in Hungary and probably all the species that are possible. And Jason, a question for you. What would you say is the best time of year to be in Romania? Or what's your favourite time of year for being there, at least? Well, to be completely honest, um, I, I've got a regular week in early September um, and I've, I've not been there in any other weeks, but I know that basically, as I mentioned before, there are seven, eight weeks that Nature Trek lead there um, per year. Um, invariably, all are fully booked. Um, so yeah, it's difficult for me to say, perhaps the chaps have got to be on this, but one of the one of the great advantages of the time that I'm there is that it's a period of, of migration. So anything can turn up. We don't get the bird song that you might get in the, the spring and the early summer tours, but we can get some fantastic, in particular, bird of prey uh, passage migration. So being a great fan of, of birds of prey, I would say, yeah, come come with me in September and we'll we'll have a great time. But yeah, I'm sure any any time will be will be excellent for, for various different reasons. Yeah. I've got very fond memories of being in the in the Carpathians in September and just seeing the fantastic autumn colours. Uh, really superb. Yeah, really, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a beautiful fantastic place. Right, yeah, just breathtaking. Uh, Richard, same question for you about Poland. What's your favourite time to go to Poland? We have someone asking. Um, so I've um, done spring, uh, early spring, sort of late late winter, early spring, and spring. So I think. The things you miss out, you see, you get a lot of things singing and just arrived when we go in sort of first weekend of May. And I think if you stay into May a little bit, you'll start getting other things which you didn't show, like um, uh, scarlet rose finch or common rose finch. Uh, you get there, you might see river warblers and things that, and redback shrikes, barred warblers, and things that turn up slightly later. Whereas on a, a, a shorter, earlier spring trip, you'll get the first, if, you, if you're lucky, you might get the first ones coming in. Um, so Alison mentioned the winter tours. I've not not done a winter tour, but I've been to um, I've been I've been to Poland when it's been snowing, uh, and and it's you know you know wolves, lynx uh, are on on the on the cards possibly. You know these are very hard things to see, but uh, you know they'll do do the best it's possible. Um, and the bison are a lot easier to see in the winter because they are they are looked up. They're sort of there's a feeding area for them. Bison. You, you wouldn't think they were hard to see, but they really are. So local knowledge is very important, but um, I'd, I'd go for spring. Thanks, Richard. And you've really got people riled up about these woodpeckers. I've got another question for you. Uh, we have uh, a question asking, where is the yellow on the three-toed woodpecker, please? Oh, well, that's that's an easy one. Sorry, it, 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 um, it's just here. It's kind of like just on the front bit of the cap. On, uh, no, no, no other woodpeckers uh, uh, in Europe has, has yellow on it uh, really like that. I mean, a, a green woodpecker is pretty yellowy on its on the on its rump, but uh, yeah. So a black and white woodpecker with a yellow patch here is the three-toed. It's quite a small woodpecker too. 
Lovely. Well, I think that is all of the questions that we've had loads of comments coming in. Uh, really nice comments from everyone saying thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Great evening, fascinating presentations. A big thank you to you all. That's from Carol Newton. Thank you, Carol. Linda Guy saying excellent presentations. Definitely whetted my appetite for more trips to Europe. Thank you, everyone. And uh, Anne Marie is saying thank you all. I'm even more excited for my Poland and Romania trips next year now. That's great to hear, Anne Marie. Well, folks, I think. Uh, if no one has any more questions, then we can bring this evening to a close. But I'd like to say a big thank you to Jason, Andrew, David, Richard, Richard and Alison for speaking to us. And thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I hope we've brightened your evening and provided you with some inspiration for travel to some destinations you might otherwise not have considered visiting, or simply just provided you with some welcome armchair travel now that the nights are getting darker. We'd love for you to join us next Tuesday on the 2nd of November, where we'll be focusing on big cats featuring jaguars, pumas, leopards, lions, cheetahs, clouded leopards, and tigers. It'll be a feline extravaganza. So we hope you can join us. You can sign up on the homepage on our website, and you'll also receive a follow-up email tomorrow, which you will contain the link where you can register as well. We hope to see you there. If you think of any more questions after this evening, then please don't hesitate to give us a ring in the office or just drop us an email. We'll be more than happy to chat to you. So until the next time, folks, it's goodbye from me and take care, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Yeah. Take care. Au revoir. Bye -bye. Bye. Au revoir, Jason. <laughs> Merci et bonne nuit. <laughs>